You've seen this image. You know what's coming next. It's the 1997 Survivor Series, and the 20,000 fans inside Montreal's Molson Centre aren't exactly sure what to expect. A rather tense bit of drama is playing out before their eyes, and when what happens next transpires, they won't exactly know what to think. They'll experience feelings of shock, certainly, confusion, definitely, and anger, inevitably. That is Canadian icon Brett the Hitman Hart lying prone on the canvas, legs crisscrossed. Across the globe, Hart is a time-tested hero in the world of professional wrestling, but in Canada, he's especially royal. The finest grappler to step out of the frozen prairies of Calgary. And at this moment, as these images flicker before a worldwide audience, he is the reigning World Wrestling Federation champion. But not for long. Hart thinks he knows how this story ends, but he really doesn't. The man twisting his legs is Shawn Michaels, the stated challenger and perpetual thorn in the side of the hitman. Though he and Hart genuinely do not like one another, with a staggering sum of ever-mounting grievances between them, they are, to this point, doing the jobs asked of them in mostly professional fashion. Two of the finest in-ring wrestlers that have ever lived, Hart and Michaels are carrying out the script of a heated battle, the main event of this particular Survivor Series. Michaels is about to flip Hart over onto his stomach in order to complete a hold known as the Sharpshooter, Hart's finishing maneuver. To Hart, this is just one step in their crescendoing dance of death, but Michaels knows that if he does this right, it's the last step. See, Michaels knows something Hart doesn't. In fact, several individuals scattered both behind the curtains and at ringside, including tense-looking boss Vince McMahon, already know how this story ends. Hart doesn't, but he'll be up to speed quickly enough. In a saga that had been historically crazy to this point, the true craziness will commence any second now. But before Michael steps over to complete this submission hold, we need to look at how this entire snapshot in time came to be. This moment and its aftermath was shaped by the sins of the past and the unsteadiness of the present, and the future of wrestling as we'd all come to know it will be molded by what happens next. There's going to be a lot to take in here. It's a professional wrestling tale that's as unbelievable as it is glaringly real. Five years can be an eternity, especially so in professional wrestling. The fact that Hart and Michaels were the top champions heading into the 1992 Survivor Series doesn't sound surprising today, but for the time, it was a bit of an eye-opener. Both were certainly talented and deserving, but Hart and Michaels being on top then signified a radical change in promotional philosophy. Increased scrutiny regarding illicit substances in professional wrestling had McMahon and company firmly under the microscope. And though Hart and Michaels weren't ever really squeaky clean on that front, at least neither of them was a walking billboard for growth hormones, so they had that going for them. Others weren't so fortunate. Throughout 1992, the WWF executed a major house cleaning that expelled talents from up and down the roster. Some of them, though not all, due to the company's need to clean up their overly testosterone image. Other cuts were just long in the tooth veterans. Check this out. Of the 44 men originally scheduled to wrestle at the 1992 Royal Rumble, 18 of them were gone by that November's Survivor Series, and over the ensuing years, the roster metamorphosis remained rabid. By November 1993, 15 of those remaining 26 left the WWF as well. By the 1994 Survivor Series, 11 turned to 7, and come the 1995 show, IRS had departed to make it 6. By one year later, the Bushwhackers had faded from the scene to bring us down to four, and those four still remained come the 1997 Survivor Series. While some of those outbound 40 made comebacks here and there, the Bulldogs, the Pipers, the Animals, and Hawks, there are just four out of the 44 that remained with the WWF as an active wrestler through that whole stretch. Owen Hart, The Undertaker, Shawn Michaels, and Bret Hart. 
The quartet was there through all of the changes, the dying wheezers of Hulkamania giving way to the ill-fated new generation. When that family-friendly pap failed to resonate with the dwindling audience, elements of 90s junk culture seeped their way in as the WWF started developing an attitude. Through all of the drastic changes in scenery and tone, Hart and Michaels consistently occupied the top title scenes, anchoring them mostly dependably. Handpicked to fill the top spots five years earlier, the Hitman and the Heartbreak Kid continued doing the WWF's heavy lifting, even when Rome burned around them. And burn, it most certainly did. For the period of May 1st, 1994 to April 30th, 1995, the WWF lost $4.4 million, leading to heavy downsizing. Though the WWF did turn a $3.3 million profit the following fiscal year, they ended up losing $6.5 million in the same stretch for 96 to 97. This was the period in which rival company World Championship Wrestling began making its boldest leaps. Steered by the aggressive hand of one Eric Bischoff, WCW positioned itself as a genuine threat to the globally renowned, though image-wounded, World Wrestling Federation. The leveling up process began with the signing of Hulk Hogan in 1994. Six months later, Macho Man Randy Savage jumped ship from the WWF, giving WCW another mainstream star that could immediately be plugged into the main event. Mesmerizing as it was to see both mega powers playing for Team Turner, four future acquisitions proved especially shocking, despite all four talents having worked for WCW previously. When WCW launched Monday Nitro as direct competition to WWF Raw in 1995, there was an unlikely name on hand to help cut the ribbon. Lex Luger. Working without a WWF contract for many months, Luger covertly negotiated a new deal with Bischoff and WCW while still making towns for McMahon. Just one day after working a WWF house show in Eastern Canada, Luger traveled to Bloomington, Minnesota, where he strode down the aisleway on the first ever Nitro broadcast, to the shock of everyone, including an unsuspecting Vince. Following that sizable shockwave, Bischoff began making a habit out of giving other ex-WWF stars the same sort of tremor-inducing reintroductions. That December, the woman known as Alundra Blaze was let go from the WWF. Still in possession of the Federation's women's title, the reborn Medusa showed up on Nitro less than a week later, binning the belt in an infamous act of defiance. Two months later, Bischoff scored two gigantic coups when he lured away a pair of McMahon's relative giants on expiring contracts, Razor Ramon and Diesel. McMahon had taken former WCW mid-carders Scott Hall and Kevin Nash and turned them into some of his top properties in the mid-90s. However, money talked. Specifically, McMahon's money was tight, whereas Bischoff had the resources to bolster his thriving product through major league deals. As Bret Hart later revealed, when Nash told him the terms of the lucrative deal offered by Bischoff, it was more than what Hart was making in his third reign as WWF champion, with far less dates. The WWF roster was already thin by the spring of 1996, especially the main event tier. The Razor and Diesel-sized voids were only going to erode the company's diminished prestige even more. And they weren't the only top WWF guys on expiring deals. In August of 1995, Hart learned from McMahon what he'd be doing for the next eight months or so. He would win the WWF title from Diesel at November's Survivor Series, before going on to drop the gold to Michaels at WrestleMania 12 in Anaheim. Hart was asked if he had any issue dropping the belt to Michaels, who by this time had gained a negative reputation in the locker room. Arrogance, political maneuverings, an apparent disdain for his peers, and a host of other issues made Sean a polarizing figure, arguably the most complete performer in all of American wrestling, but one with plenty of baggage. Nonetheless, Hart was cool with losing the belt to Michaels. Though he and others were well aware of Michaels' various idiosyncrasies and habits, he believed that Michaels had earned a run with the gold. And Michaels looked to be the ideal ace. While most of WCW's top guys aged older, 30-year-old Michaels was younger, hipper, wildly charismatic, and could do more between the ropes. 
And so, in overtime of a grueling 60-minute Iron Man match, Michaels vanquished Hart with two superkicks, culminating the so-termed boyhood dream. Michaels was now the leader of the new generation, the on-screen general in what was becoming a heated Monday Night War. At the time of Michaels' victory, WWF Monday Night Raw was hanging tough with the fresher, more daring WCW Nitro in the Nielsen ratings, though it had only won head-to-head -head four times thus far in 1996. Post-WrestleMania, however, Raw won the next six matchups with Nitro, though those were mostly weeks in which WCW scheduling was compromised by the NBA playoffs. By mid-May, an unencumbered WCW was winning again and was about to unveil the latest in their long line of shiny new toys. On May 27th, the former Razor Ramon jumped the rail on WCW Monday Nitro during an undercard bout. The intrusion was faux reality done justice, as Scott Hall and two weeks later Kevin Nash became the talk of the industry by gatecrashing Monday Nitro on a weekly basis. Beginning the week after Nash's first appearance, Nitro began a near two-year run of dominance over Raw, beating them every single week in the Nielsen ratings into April of 1998. It was quite ironic that after the biggest win of his career, Michael's exploits were taking a backseat to what his best friends were doing on the other channel. The July 1st episode of Raw pitted champion Michaels against former partner Marty Jannetty, and Nitro beat Raw 3.3 to 2.6 in the ratings. Two weeks later, Michaels successfully defended his title against tag team champion Billy Gunn. Nitro won again, this time 3.4 to 2.6. Come August 12th, the go-home show before SummerSlam, Michaels faced Owen Hart in a non-title bout, and Nitro pasted Raw that night 3.3 to 2.0. Of course, by this time, Hall and Nash's act was complemented by the heel turn of Hulk Hogan, the vaunted third man of the New World Order. WCW was blazing hot, and Michaels alone wasn't enough to temper the momentum of Bischoff's rising empire. And things were worse on the pay-per-view front. July's bash at the beach with the third man intrigue nearly doubled the buys of the WWF's In Your House International Incident, 170,000 buys to 90,000. More humbling, the institutional SummerSlam with Michaels on top taking on Vader managed just 157,000 buys, the second lowest of any Big Four pay-per-view ever pre-network. Eight nights earlier, 220,000 households purchased the first ever WCW Hog Wild, where the aging Hogan regained the world title by defeating the Giant at the Sturgis Biker Rally. Michaels was still every bit the dynamic talent he'd always been, but around him, the WWF was an ice-cold product, matched up against a scorching hot WCW that was mining a million-dollar storyline. And while all of this was playing out, Bret Hart was sitting at home, and he would soon have a decision to make. The WrestleMania 12 Championship loss kicked off a period of hiatus for the Hitman. For the next seven months, the only matches that Hart took part in were during international tours, as Bret relished getting to see the world. Aside from those excursions to Germany, Kuwait, and South Africa, Hart was out of the WWF loop. The spotlight was set upon Michaels, while the 38-year-old ex-champion mostly just recharged his batteries at home, away from the promotion's storylines. Except for the one he'd set up before he left. During Michaels' tearful celebration with the WWF title in Anaheim, a dejected, deflated Hart not so subtly snubbed him not even shaking his fellow babyface's hand. According to Hart, this was agreed upon by he and Michaels ahead of time, to create a sense of friction over the match's result, setting the right tone for the inevitable rematch. In fact, a lot of the boys in the back thought that Brett and Sean had legitimate heat with one another over the clear snub. To Brett's way of thinking, it was perfect. Let the boys feed the sheets with rumors of friction. Let the insiders and the fans think that there's acrimony between the two. It'll make for good TV. 
And Hart apparently had every intention of coming back to WWF TV, but he also wanted to explore outside opportunities, such as acting. He was quite cognizant that at 38 going on 39 and with diminishing tread on his tires, his days as a full-time wrestler were likely winding down. For the time being, while Michaels wore the championship, Hart was going to enjoy this sabbatical, in no hurry to come back. Meanwhile, shortly into that sabbatical, Hart's WWF contract expired. Not too long after, Hart was in New York for some media endeavor when he took a meeting at McMahon's home with both Vince and Jim Ross. Brett recalls a pleasant and friendly powwow where the two officials attempted to re-sign him, only for him to defer for the time being. But to give some assurance that he would eventually be back, Hart laid out a pitch for the continuation of his rivalry with Michaels. Playing off the tension from WrestleMania, Hart would regain the title in another babyface versus babyface rematch, and this would set up the rubber match in which Hart would put Michaels over once and for all. By sheer coincidence, on one of his flights home, Hart found himself on a plane with Shawn Michaels in the midst of touring as WWF champion. Seated together, Hart decided to let Michaels in on his pitch. He explained the two rematches and claims that Michaels didn't seem too thrilled with the prospect of losing their next encounter. As Hart wrote, I saw the color drained from his face. He clearly didn't like the sound of any of this. With WCW winning weekly on the strength of the compelling NWO drama, headed up by his best friends no less, and the weight of the world that a champion must bear, one could understand why being reminded of an inevitable title loss might stick in the craw of a stressed out title holder. Speaking of stressed, the next time McMahon met with Brett, the WWF boss was apparently less tranquil than before. The day after the July 1996 In Your House in Vancouver, McMahon chartered a flight to Hart's Calgary home, where he tried to re-sign his former champion then and there. Hart chalked up McMahon's sudden insistence on hammering out a deal to the Hogan reveal at Bash at the Beach, as the WWF didn't have anything to counter the wallop of Hogan's head-spinning turn. Brett even claims that McMahon told him to name his price, and even informed him of what top earners Michaels and Undertaker were making, about $700,000 a piece in case you're wondering. And though the ball was firmly in his court, Hart again declined to sign when prompted. While Hart wanted to remain with the WWF to finish his career in the place where he was given the opportunity to reach unfathomable heights as a star wrestler, he also remembered what Nash had told him about his WCW contract, the big money for less dates. Now 39 years old, Hart wouldn't have many more chances to command such a towering deal, and with four kids at home, he wanted to make sure that he chose the right path. That September, three days after the WWF ran its Mind Games pay-per-view in Philadelphia, Hart was in Los Angeles to film a guest spot for The Simpsons when he was met at his hotel by Eric Bischoff, who had gotten wind that he was in town. Eventually, Easy e got down to business. He asked Hart what it would take to get him to jump ship. What Brett apparently wanted was for WCW to put out a sizable offer, one that he could take back to the WWF as leverage for what could potentially be his final contract as a full-time wrestler. He wanted to stay in New York, but he also wanted to make this deal count. So he threw out a somewhat lofty request, $3 million a year and a lighter schedule. And two days later, Bischoff got back to heart with the official offer. $2.8 million a year for three years at 180 dates per year. If Hart signed that contract, he stood to make more than four times per year what he'd made on his last WWF deal. When Hart told Vince of the offer, McMahon conceded that he couldn't match the deal. Hart then simply asked him to make the best offer possible. He later wrote, I was in a position where, if I wanted to, I could pound out three more years and go home with no worries, at least not financial ones. But could I kiss my entire legacy goodbye in order to end up at WCW? 
On Wednesday, October 9th, McMahon flew to Calgary to present his counter-offer in person. A 20-year deal worth $10.5 million. Over the first three years, Hart would make $1.5 million a year as a main event wrestler. For seven years afterward, Hart would earn $500,000 annually as a senior advisor to Vince. For the final decade, beginning at age 49, an all-but-retired Hart would earn $250,000 annually as a standby legend who may or may not be used, but would be taken care of financially as he reached his middle age. It was a made-man deal. Before McMahon laid out those terms, Hart put out one more request. A filmmaker named Paul Jay wanted to do a documentary on Hart, and so Brett asked that Jay have access to his matches and the WWF backstage area for the project. And McMahon agreed. Though WCW's offer was in the same financial ballpark for 17 less years, Hart didn't want to leave the WWF and was satisfied with what McMahon offered. They shook on the deal in Hart's Calgary home. Hart's return to WWF television was set for the October 21st Raw, where he would address Stone Cold Steve Austin's numerous callouts, accepting his challenge for a match at Survivor Series in November. But first, Hart had to sign his contract. It took longer than expected, but after days of waiting, Hart finally received a draft of his contract the Friday before his planned return. But according to Brett, the terms of the contract didn't reflect what he and McMahon had agreed upon, and Hart called this particular draft very controlling. After threatening to no-show Raw, which he could do since he was still a free agent, Brett demanded the right contract with the terms that he'd agreed to. He did fly into Fort Wayne, Indiana on Monday for the Raw taping, but did so with his unsigned WCW contract in his back pocket. Again, still a free agent. Finally, one hour before Raw kicked off, with his attorney and accountant present, Hart signed his proper contract backstage at Raw. This proper deal actually afforded more concessions to Hart, one of which was quite interesting. Should Brett ever leave the WWF for any reason whatsoever, he would receive reasonable creative control over his final 30 days under contract, to avoid being buried on the way out. That might become important later. Hart made his scheduled appearance in front of the Fort Wayne crowd, helping Raw to its highest TV audience in nearly two months. But all was not so serene in the WWF. Some weren't particularly happy with the terms of Brett's new deal, and one of those individuals was apparently Vince himself. In the nine-day holdup between pitching the offer to Hart and actually sending him the modified contract, McMahon was having second thoughts about the big money and the seeded power that he was offering Brett. It was Carl DeMarco, WWF's head of Canadian operations, who advised McMahon that signing Hart was paramount. DeMarco reasoned that losing Hart would damage their business north of the border, a Federation stronghold. So McMahon made the deal. Also annoyed was Michaels, who was now in the final month of his first reign as WWF champion. The Heartbreak Kid claimed that when he re-upped his contract in early 1996, McMahon told him that he was the WWF's highest paid talent. And so, Michaels was insulted that McMahon was now paying 39-year-old back from sabbatical heart double per year what the overworked WWF champion was making. Already irritated with Brett for some of the worky, shooty comments he'd written about him in his weekly Calgary Sun columns, ostensibly building to the pair's inevitable rematch, Michaels vented his rage at McMahon. As Michaels recalled, in the same meeting where McMahon tried to lay out to Michaels the plan of having him lose the belt to Brett at WrestleMania 13 in Chicago, Michaels not only bristled angrily about that plan, citing Hart's prior comments about him, but also openly took issue with Hart's towering contract. Contract. Angry about all matters, Brett, Sean expressed to Vince a complete disinterest in working with him at WrestleMania 13. Personal disinterest aside, come early 1997, Michaels vs. Hart at WrestleMania 13 still looked to be on the books. 
After losing the title to Psycho Sid at the 1996 Survivor Series, Sean regained the gold in front of 60,000 fans in the Alamo Dome in his native San Antonio at the Royal Rumble. Hart, the odds-on Rumble match winner, was screwed over at the end of the 30-man gauntlet by an already eliminated Austin. However, Brett was soon booked for a Four Corners match at the February In Your House, with his wrongfully stolen title opportunity at stake. Common Sense had Hart winning the four-way and Michael strolling into Mania with the title so that the rematch could take place. About that. In early February, Hart spoke with McMahon, who laid out an entirely different plan going forward. Michaels was going to drop the title to Sid on a special Thursday Night Raw the following week via Hart's interference. Michaels would then cost Hart the four-way match at In Your House three nights later, enabling Undertaker to win. Hart and Michaels would still face off at WrestleMania, but without the championship at stake. When Hart asked why the plan had changed, he claimed McMahon said it was too predictable. McMahon even proposed that for the WrestleMania match after Hart's victory, he could shave Michaels bald. To Brett, the haircut suggestion sounded like Vince trying to soften the reality that Hart had already figured out. Michaels was refusing to put him over at WrestleMania for the title. Then, over a week later, the very idea of any Hart vs. Michaels match would get reduced to match? What match? In the day before he was to lose the belt to Sid, Michaels informed the WWF office that he was taking time off due to a serious and sudden knee injury, thus forfeiting the title. The timing was curious, seeing as Michaels had just worked a house show match involving Hart days earlier and nothing seemed out of sorts. When the news of his championship vacancy began making the rounds, skeptical wrestlers didn't believe the injury. Hart even quotes Undertaker as saying, I'll believe it when I see the scar. That little f doesn't want to drop the belt. That Thursday night, instead of wrestling Sid, Michael's appearance was in an in-ring interview with McMahon, where he would hand the belt over to an also-present Gorilla Monsoon. Many in the crowd at the auditorium in Lowell, Massachusetts weren't unanimously sympathetic toward Michael's morose speech, some booing and some even chanting, we want Sid. After parting with the physical belt, Michaels then uttered one of the most ridiculed and parodied lines in wrestling's history when he said, I know that over the last several months, I've lost a lot of things, and one of them has been my smile. With McMahon there providing emotional support, Michaels made it through his lost smile speech, the tone of which felt like a melancholy farewell from a star struck down in his prime. However, in conjunction with the coverage of Sean's title abdication, Dave Meltzer reported that renowned orthopedic surgeon Dr. James Andrews gave Michaels a much brighter prognosis, believing that the now former champion could be back in the ring after just four to six weeks of rehab with no surgery required. Minor spoiler alert, Michaels resumed wrestling the last week of May, three and a half months after forfeiting the belt. Certainly that's more than four to six weeks, but far less than, say, the remainder of one's natural life. But with Michaels sidelined for however long, Hart was going to need a new WrestleMania opponent. From a quality standpoint, the match he got was the ultimate in happy accidents, but it came with a character twist. Ordinarily a confident and collected master technician that handled pressure better than most, the Hitman character slowly started coming undone. After Austin's unjust victory in the 97 Rumble match, Hart briefly quit the company during the next night's episode of Raw. It was an uncharacteristic move for a resilient and self-confident wrestler to simply take his ball and go home when confronted by injustice. Hart worried that fans would come to resent his character's new habit of whining, but he went along with the plan. The storyline inequities kept coming, as his fourth reign as WWF champion, he'd won Sean's vacated belt at the February In Your House, ended 24 hours later when Austin cost Hart in a title defense against Sid. Four weeks later, Brett lost a steel cage rematch to Sid on Raw following interference from Undertaker. And it was after that match that Hart went on a high-volume, profanity-filled rant that went beyond what was permissible on USA Network at the time. 
this wasn't the cool, calm, and collected Bret Hart of old. In fact, Hart was about to commence his first heel run in nine years at WrestleMania 13 as part of an ambitious double turn. In lieu of a WrestleMania match with Michaels, Hart was positioned once more against Austin, this time in a submission match refereed by UFC icon Ken Shamrock. What followed is perhaps the greatest WrestleMania match of all time, or it's at least in that neighborhood. Austin bled buckets during the hate-filled struggle, which culminated in Hart snaring his foe into his trademark sharpshooter. Austin refused to surrender, instead passing out from the alarming amount of blood loss. After the match, an unsatisfied Brett began attacking emotionless Austin before Shamrock sent him to the mat with a waistlock throw. Hart backed down from a fired up world's most dangerous man, leaving the ring to a chorus of boos. Later in the card, Hart gate crashed The Undertaker Sid WWF title match on three occasions, while guest commentator Michaels mocked and laughed at him from the ringside table. The next night on Raw, Hart solidified his heel turn by railing against the moral decay of the United States. This character attack was proposed to Hart two weeks earlier by McMahon, who suggested a radical concept. Hart would be a heel in the United States, but a babyface everywhere else in the world. Vince reasoned that the US was despised internationally and wanted Hart to take up the cause against the WWF's lawless Americans. Brett mulled over the pros and cons before ultimately agreeing to do the turn. One of the points that he used to sell himself was that he and Michaels would no longer be on the same side of the depth chart. There would be no more silent competition or bitterness over who outranked who on the babyface side of the roster. With the turn came the recruitment of allies. Brother Owen, English brother-in-law Davy Boy Smith, American brother-in-law Jim Neidhart, and longtime family acquaintance Brian Pillman all joined Brett's cause, resurrecting the Hart Foundation name for their anti-American crusade. Their targets? American patriots and other sworn enemies. You know, like this guy. Michaels may have been inactive as a wrestler, but he remained a nuisance to Hart, and with tensions continuing to mount, Michaels used his words to stoke the flames of animosity. On the April 7th episode of Raw from Muncie, Indiana, Michaels delivered a biting work-shoot promo on Hart. While Sean acknowledged their genuine dislike of one another, he claimed that Brett was very much the bad guy in real life. He accused Hart of exploiting his own family for money, that Brett grumbled about putting Michaels over, and said that Brett returning to the WWF for any claimed reason besides money was horse In an oddly prescient line, Michaels vowed that Hart's obsession with him and the WWF title will ultimately be your destruction. At the time of the promo, Hart was not in the arena. He was off in Kuwait doing promotional work. Owen, Davy Boy, and Brett's friend slash personal advisor Marcy Engelstein had made Hart aware of what Michaels had said. Hart took serious umbrage with the concocted claims made by Sean, particularly when Michaels claimed that business had been better when he won the championship. For Michael's part, he felt justified in his comments, in large part because he perceived Hart's frequent remarks about him to be personal attacks. Michaels later chalked up his perception to being unable to see the difference in his character being attacked and he the person being attacked. He said, I didn't have the ability emotionally to look at things as just business back then. Hart even concedes that he understands how his harsh comments struck a nerve with Michaels, adding, I did it in such a realistic, nasty way that Sean thought I wasn't being legitimate with him. With that level of distrust, any sort of miscue between them could lead to big problems. Such was the case on the night of May 12th. For that night's Raw, Hart and Michaels shared the ring for the closing segment. The two had earlier agreed to make some semblance of peace, but that went out the window right after Raw went off the air. At the time, Hart was mostly bound to a wheelchair following genuine knee surgery. Nonetheless, he was set to work with Michaels in a match at the 97 King of the Ring, where if Hart lost, he could no longer wrestle in the United States. For this segment, Hart was supposed to berate Michaels incessantly, only for Michaels to shut him up by superkicking him out of the wheelchair. And that's exactly what happened. The problem was, Hart went long with his diatribe and Raw signed off while Brett was still browbeating his enemy. The superkick did take place, but viewers at home never saw it. 
And when Michaels found out backstage about the snafu, which was reportedly due to Hart forgetting the line that would spur the kick, he was livid. Michaels felt that Hart had purposely sabotaged the angle, which made Sean look like a total dope as he stood there just absorbing Brett's ridicule, offering no rejoinder. The following week, Michaels made sure that he got his point across. Taunting the Hart Foundation from the Titan Tron, an oddly acting Michaels accused Brett of having some sunny days, an open insinuation that Hart had been having an affair with Tammy Sitch. Hart didn't fully hear the remark when Michaels uttered it due to crowd noise, but once backstage, many of the boys were up in arms over what Michaels had said. Brett's own family even got wind of that barely veiled accusation. Hart was furious, and he knew that he had to pay Sean back. However, he decided to bide his time for when his knee was a little bit healthier. He went to Vince to pull out of the King of the Ring match, citing a slower recovery than anticipated. The night after the King of the Ring, though, both Hart and Michaels were in attendance for the June 9th Raw in Hartford, Connecticut. Both were to figure into the night's broadcast, but neither ended up appearing. See, 40 minutes before Raw went on the air, an altercation took place backstage. Months upon months of caustic animosity finally boiled over into violence, as Hart beat Michaels up in the locker room. As several accounts have it, it began with words being exchanged. Brett threw the first punch and missed, but caught Sean with a second. The struggle continued, with still injured Hart grabbing Michaels by the hair and trying to violently swing him by the roots. Michaels went after Hart's wounded knee, only for Hart to take Michaels down to the locker room floor. With Sean pinned down, Hart began raining down strikes. Pat Patterson tried to intervene, even asking for help from both Davey Boy Smith and Brian Crush Adams. Allies of Brett, neither offered any. When Hart was finally pried off of Michaels, he'd ripped out a chunk of Sean's hair in his hand. He parted by cautioning Sean, don't with me or my family. Backstage official Jim Cornette went to inform Vince about what had just transpired, but seconds after he entered the boss's office, a battered Michaels stormed in. He threw the clump of his own hair down on Vince's desk, angrily claimed that this was an unsafe working environment, and announced that he was quitting. And with that, Michaels left the arena and went home. Legal maneuvering commenced to try and get Michaels to return to work as the WWF claimed a contract breach on his part and were willing to withhold his pay. Michaels' attorney countered by reiterating the unsafe working environment that Sean was claiming. Michaels went so far as to ask for his release, wanting to join friends Hall, Nash and Sean Waltman in WCW, but by early July, Michaels was coaxed back to the WWF after Vince personally met with him in San Antonio. He promised his star wrestler that he would make the WWF fun for him again. Upon being drawn back, Michaels was apparently a little quicker to work with Hart again and accepted a role as guest referee for Hart's title match with The Undertaker at the 1997 SummerSlam. The finish played on the massive amount of heat between the two. Hart went to use a steel chair, which Michaels pried away from him. After exchanging words, Hart spat at Michaels, who then wildly swung the chair, only for Brett to duck, causing Undertaker to eat the steel. Hart made the cover, while an angry, apprehensive Michaels fulfilled his official obligations by registering the count. Hart recalls there being a sense of peace between the two men after the match, as they shook hands in the locker room and thanked each other. But for Hart, the championship win was bittersweet. It was his fifth jaunt to the top of the WWF mountain, yes, but he may have just been aced out as the company's top heel. That's because Michael's errant chair shot at SummerSlam kicked off his own heel turn, pitting him against Undertaker in a new rivalry. Hunter Hearst Helmsley in China soon joined Michaels post-turn, as did a returning ravishing Rick Rude in a bodyguard role comprising the original D-Generation X. The day of SummerSlam, Hart quizzically pondered to Pat Patterson about his and Sean's futures, if both wrestlers being on the same side of the alignment fence was only going to renew hostilities. Just as they did babyfaces, Hart figured he and Michaels would jockey for position atop the heap once more. In fact, Michaels headlined the next two American pay-per-views, facing Undertaker in both matches, including the inaugural Hell in a Cell match at Bad Blood in October. Hart, meanwhile, worked second from top on both shows, despite being the champion. 
Sean also headlined a special event that took place in between those American events, in a match that proved rather controversial. One night only, a pay-per-view broadcast exclusively in Canada and Europe emanated from Birmingham, England on Saturday, September 20th. In the main event, national hero Davy Boy Smith would defend his European title against Shawn Michaels. The match looked like a slam dunk win for Smith, given the home court advantage, and in fact, the Bulldog was told weeks in advance by McMahon that he was going over. With this in mind, Smith dedicated the match to his cancer-stricken sister Tracy, who would be in attendance with Smith's wife and Brett and Owen's sister, Diana. So imagine Smith's shock when McMahon changed the finish hours before the match and decided to have Sean go over instead. Michaels indeed won through tons of chicanery and yeah, not a happy crowd at all. Some might accuse Michaels of politicking his way to a belt that he didn't need over the brother-in-law of his greatest professional rival. But actually, it was Vince's call. Supposedly, McMahon wanted to build to a rematch on the next UK tour, where Smith would presumably have gone over. But McMahon may have had other motives for selecting that finish. One byproduct of that motive was that even if it meant low bridging Davy Boy in front of his countrymen, Vince felt he needed to keep Michaels especially strong. And that is because Vince was about to have a very tense conversation with Brett, one that could have drastic implications on the company moving forward. On Monday, September 22nd, McMahon flat out told Hart that he was intending to breach his 20-year contract, not even one year into the deal. McMahon had first broached the idea of restructuring Brett's deal as far back as June, claiming financial hardship. At the time, Vince floated the idea of stripping down Hart's weekly salary for the time being, with the intent of paying out the withheld amount when the WWF became more profitable down the line. Brett wasn't too happy with that idea, so you can imagine how stunned he was to hear Vince now telling him that he was going to flat out violate his contract. McMahon later said, I had made a bad deal. I didn't want to pay that because I didn't think he was worth it. More surreal, McMahon also suggested that if Hart wanted to reach back out to WCW to see if they'd offer him his original deal, he would welcome that because it would actually be doing him a favor financially. All of this, mind you, while Brett the Hitman Hart was the reigning WWF champion. Hart felt as if he was being shown the door. He worried he'd have to sue Vince for said breach of contract. There didn't seem to be a happy ending anywhere in there. With the WWF's written consent, Hart met with Bischoff once again, with a negotiating window that closed at midnight on November 1st. Hart made it clear that if he were to jump ship, he'd want the same $2.8 million per year offer that Bischoff put together a year earlier. Bischoff said that he needed to get the proper authorization, and negotiations were left there. On Halloween day, when Hart returned home from a tour, Bischoff called him with his offer. $2.5 million annually for three years, with just 125 dates a year, only working about 10 or 11 days per month. By comparison, Hart was working 275 dates a year for the WWF for a million less dollars. The next day, Brett called McMahon, pressing him to counter WCW's offer. If not money, then something creative. Or, at the very least, just the notion that he was still even wanted around there. To Hart's senses, McMahon seemed aloof and detached towards him. Meanwhile, an eager Bischoff called Hart back, asking if there was anything he could do to sweeten an already mouth-watering deal. Hart requested full injury insurance and the permission to arrive to events after the general call time, which Bischoff granted. Somewhat shell-shocked by the ongoing turn of events, Hart told Bischoff that they had a deal. Brett waited the remainder of Saturday for Vince to get back to him. With the deadline drawing near, McMahon finally called Hart. The two had an uneasy conversation, as Vince seemed to have little interest in keeping Brett around. Irritated, Brett noted how he'd been systematically weakened by a year's worth of booking. From remolding the Hitman character as a frequent whiner, to alienating his American fans, to the usurping of his top heel spot in favor of Michaels. Hart was asking the man who'd authorized these changes for some kind of lifeline, but there was none. McMahon ended the call by advising Brett to think with your head, not your heart, pushing him to the WCW offer. 
With that, a morose hitman signed his new WCW contract before faxing it. As far as the WWF went, Brett's one-month notice had been activated, and you may recall that Hart's 20-year contract came with a very interesting clause, a provision not added until just before he'd signed it. You know, the one about reasonable creative control for Hart's final 30 days with the company? You may also recall that Bret Hart at this point was still the WWF champion. And now would be a good time to point out that in just a week's time, Hart would be defending said title against Shawn Michaels at the 1997 Survivor Series in Montreal. Now would also be a good time to point out that on October 12th at a house show in San Jose, Hart told Michaels before a locker room of their assembled peers that he would have no problem dropping the belt to him if that's what Vince wanted. Then, for some reason, Michaels decided this would be a good time in front of said same peers to puff out his chest and tell Hart that he wasn't willing to do the same for him before leaving the room in a defiant huff. After that, Hart believed that there was no way that he could put Michaels over, not after that kind of blatant disrespect. McMahon wanted Hart to lose to Michaels, but Brett, citing Sean's disrespect and the creative control clause, wouldn't budge. He offered to drop the title to literally anyone else, but McMahon was insistent on it being Sean at Survivor Series. McMahon had his jewels in a vice. The last thing Vince wanted was for Bischoff to go on Nitro and proudly announce that he'd signed away the reigning WWF champion. There are some who believe McMahon's concern was over Brett showing up on Nitro with the belt, and that was not going to happen, seeing as WCW and WWF had tied up in court over the Medusa incident of 1995. Thus, Bischoff wouldn't have dared reprise that moment. But there was nothing stopping Bischoff from announcing that the current WWF title holder was jumping ship. In fact, Bischoff promised a huge announcement for the November 10th Nitro, one day after Survivor Series. In a heated Monday Night War, the pain of that sort of low blow wouldn't fade so easily. In McMahon's mind, he had to get the belt off Hart as fast as possible. But Brett stuck to his guns in discussions with Vince over the finish and seemed to hold all the cards. They eventually reached a compromise in which Hart would win over Michaels via DQ, but would lose the title at December's In Your House in a four-way match, provided Hart could get a one-week extension on his WWF deal approved by WCW, which he did. It wasn't ideal circumstances, and the WWF was likely to come out of the situation less than rosy, but McMahon found a way to ease Hart out of the door, mostly cleanly. So you can probably guess that a certain someone wasn't thrilled with this plan. Michaels, backed up by an irate Triple H, called McMahon on Wednesday, November 5th to express anger over the suggested finish, refusing to give Hart any sort of win on his way out. So McMahon reached back out to Hart, who again refused to lose the title within McMahon's preferred time frame. They were at a critical impasse, and McMahon had no answers, until someone in his creative circle inadvertently gave him one. Jim Cornette was just as sick of the squabbles as his boss was. Additionally, he couldn't believe McMahon didn't think to get the belt off of Brett before sending him spiraling into Bischoff's waiting arms. Cornette, seeing Vince twisting over this conundrum, suggested just screwing Brett over, frustratedly uttering the words, God damn it, Vince, it's your belt, just double cross him. Speaking with the two remaining click members later, Triple H came to a similar conclusion, saying if he doesn't want to do business, then we need to do business for him. From there, McMahon endorsed this extreme idea. He'd enacted it before against Wendy Richter, but this would be much more high profile. It was a last resort, but a very real possibility. Though he knew it could be ugly, Michaels was up for it. McMahon instructed Sean that when the screw job was carried out, to act just as confused as everyone else. Vince himself wanted to be the sole target of any and all anger in the aftermath, though others would surely be blamed. From there, the conspiracy began coming together. 
On Saturday, November 8th, as Hart wrestled his last WWF match in the United States at a house show in Detroit, McMahon and his various confidants were already in Montreal, staging their production meeting. At what appeared to be the conclusion of the meeting, McMahon asked a few of his closest allies to stay behind while the others left. Those select few were clued in as to what was going to happen in the main event the next night. While it's not 100% clear who knew, neither Pat Patterson nor Jim Ross knew. Patterson was the head road agent, and Ross was head of talent relations. McMahon understood the locker room would be in an uproar when everything went down, and didn't want to risk the boys being unable to trust those two due to their job titles. Gerald Briscoe, however, was one of the ones that was in on the plan. He was advised to help concoct the match finish, as well as teach Michaels some self-defense holds to use, in case Hart jumped him after the match. Meanwhile, a paranoid Hart, who'd been warned by some vets about the possibility of a double cross, personally sought out referee Earl Hebner, the assigned official to the title match. When Hart told him that he was concerned about a screw job, but taken aback Hebner pledged loyalty, vowing that he would never allow that to happen. At Survivor Series the next day, the proposed finish that made the rounds was a DQ, followed by Hart vacating the title the next night on Raw. Not ideal, but aside from Brett Lane ducking the title into the December in your house, what else could they get the parties to agree on? McMahon had been the regular lead announcer for WWF's main shows up to this point, including pay-per-views. On this night, however, Ross and Jerry Lawler alone would comprise the broadcast team. McMahon told Hart that he would be there with the other officials to hit the ring on the DQ-laden finish, to make it look like a shoot. And incredibly, Hart didn't think anything was amiss with Vince not being on headset. Michaels, meanwhile, had pondered what move or hold he would use to create the finish, but he still needed to put together the match with Brett in order to know where to inject the unexpected ending. He later said, I felt really bad for him because I knew this was the end and he had no idea what was coming. The two got together with an unsuspecting Patterson to devise the match. At one juncture, Patterson pondered if it was possible to do a sharpshooter reversal spot in which Michaels would apply Hart's own hold only for Brett to sweep the feet and stand up into his own counter version. And in Michaels' mind, that was it. He admitted to tuning out the rest of the discussion because this was the finish. He took the spot to Vince, who concurred that they had their ending. As for Hebner, despite giving his word to Brett that he wouldn't double-cross him, the official was given marching orders to do just that just hours before the match. It's disputed who got Hebner on board. Michaels said it was him, Hebner claimed it was Briscoe, but the end result was the same. Hebner was now under orders to call for the bell when Michaels had Hart snared in the sharpshooter. And before anyone knew it, the main event of the seven-match Survivor Series was at hand. After a lengthy entrance video, the two combatants were shown making the long walk through the backstage area for their respective entrances. Michaels entered first, the incorrigible villain, if he weren't hated enough, his desecration of a Canadian flag only had the crowd frothing even more. Hart entered second to the expected deafening cheers. Michaels jumped the champion before the bell, kicking off a wild arena-encompassing brawl that McMahon and a slew of other officials attempted to intervene on. JR alternated between acknowledging the real-life melodrama and calling the chaos unfolding before him, underscoring an atmosphere unlike any WWF main event that came before it. Patterson and referee Jack Doan both got decked in the midst of the brawl, as McMahon and others pleaded for Hart and Michaels to just get back in the ring. And then finally, the proper match began, but the simmering tension remained heavy in the air. As the battle seesawed, Hart attempted a sledge from the ropes, only for Michaels to pull Hebner into his path, bumping him. Waiting in the wings were Hart Foundation and DX members, as well as referee Mike Kyoda, to be dispatched at different cues per the plan. Michaels soon after took Hart down, and that takes us back to where this story started out. Sean began twisting Hart's legs to execute the sharpshooter, as was arranged. However, to the confusion of many, but certainly not everyone, Hebner began standing up prematurely. Michaels turned Hart onto his stomach to complete the move, at which point a vertical Hebner appeared before Brett. 
Making exuberant hand gestures typical of referee pantomime, Hebner feigned like he was questioning Hart before turning to call for the bell, just as Brett desperately tried to trip Sean. The last distinct sound before the bell rang was Vince yelling to timekeeper Mark Yeaton, ring the bell, ring the bell. Michaels, as instructed, feigned ignorance and confusion. An irate Hart calmly stood up and spat into the face of Vince McMahon at ringside. Ross openly bemoaned the controversy that had just taken place, vaguely acknowledging that what happened here was no work. Michaels was handed the belt amid the confusion and was escorted up the aisle by Helmsley and Briscoe. The pay-per-view broadcast faded not long after Michaels spun through the entrance curtain, lest anything truly regrettable and ugly wind up on everybody's TV screen. Though not broadcast to the home viewer, Hart, flanked by Owen, Smith, and Neidhart, drew the letters WCW in the air with his finger before taking the TV monitors at ringside and violently spiking them onto the arena floor as righteously angry fans cheered him on. As for Hebner, he'd already bolted from the arena. Twin brother Dave, a WWF official, was waiting outside the venue in a running car and the two got the hell out of Dodge. Making his way past throngs of astonished fans, Hart stormed up the aisleway and behind the curtain, where more history would soon be made. Some of the fallout was filmed by the production crew of one Paul Jay, the filmmaker that had wanted to do that documentary on Hart. Indeed, he was backstage that night at the Molson Center, capturing some unexpected moments for posterity, including Brett's then-wife Julie admonishing Triple H for his part in whatever the hell had just happened. The locker room mood was now mutinous, as furious wrestlers began destroying things. Mick Foley even briefly quit the organization out of anger, though his walkout lasted only a day after he was talked into returning. The others in the Hart contingent all walked out, their futures with the company uncertain. At one juncture, Hart beelined toward Vince's office where the boss was holed up with Son Shane, as well as Briscoe, Sergeant Slaughter, and others. Brett tried to break the steel door down to no avail. He then returned to the locker room, where he questioned new champion Michaels regarding his involvement. Though Hart knew the real answer, Michaels lied, swearing that he wasn't in on it. He promised that he didn't have any part of it, to which Brett said he would judge him by what he did on Raw the next night. Hart then addressed the stunned locker room, telling the boys that if Vince could do this to him, he could do it to anyone. That is when an angry Undertaker announced that he was going to bring Vince down there and make him explain himself. And with that, the locker room leader was off to fetch McMahon. Minutes later, Undertaker returned with Vince and his associates. By this time, Hart was already in the shower. When informed that Vince was there, Brett told his confidants to get Vince out of there, that it wasn't a safe place for him to be. But Vince wouldn't budge. He insisted on facing Brett. When Brett got out of the shower and began to get dressed, McMahon started into his explanation, saying that it was the first time that he had to lie to one of his wrestlers. Brett immediately called him out on that statement and other apparent remarks made during this tense summit. As Hart fired back at his soon-to-be ex-boss over an innumerable number of lies told to him over the previous year, he had Owen, Davy Boy, Neidhart, Vader, Shamrock, Foley, Rude, Crush, Savio Vega, and Undertaker all backing him up. Brett then added that if Vince was still there by the time he finished getting dressed, he was going to knock him out. Hart was hoping that Vince would eventually leave the room, because after he'd said this piece, he understood there was only one logical follow-up. But Vince… Vince wasn't leaving. At one juncture before the tirade began, Hart advised Paul Jay's film crew to leave the room. Lamentably, they missed what happened next. After Brett tied his shoes, he slowly stood up and physically engaged Vince. Surrounded by their closest allies, Brett sought to make one good shot count. And with that, before anybody could step in, Hart rocked McMahon with a jolting uppercut, flush on the chin. McMahon recoiled backward and landed on the floor with a thud. After some further jostling among the parties, the sides separated, with Vince laying motionless on the carpet. 
As if the punch wasn't bad enough, McMahon also apparently broke his ankle after either, according to Brett, landing badly off the punch or, according to Vince, because Briscoe accidentally stepped on it during the ensuing skirmish. Though not present in the room when the fight took place, Paul J's film crew did capture a woozy McMahon as he limped down the hallway, braced by his inner circle. Hart's final act before leaving was to walk over to Michaels, who by this time was disconsolate by all that had just occurred. Though he was 99% certain that Sean was in on it, he decided to leave with a peaceable act. Hart offered Michaels his now broken hand and simply thanked him for the match. Before long, the story was out. About the conspiracy, the backstage incident, all of the before and after that had surrounded that fateful sharpshooter. Brett ended up giving his entire side of the story to Dave Meltzer. He figured that exposing the business was the last thing that Vince believed he would ever do, even if he were double-crossed. But with one phone call, Hart offered up a thorough recollection that would counter any story that the WWF spin doctoring could muster. Brett debuted in WCW on December 15th. In his very first promo, he made a clear allusion to Montreal, which the crowd knowingly roared over. Despite reigning twice as WCW champion, Hart's WCW run was a lackluster use of a genuine star. Though at odds with Vince, Brett later conceded that his estranged ex-boss was right when he said that WCW would never know what to do with him. With Hart out of the picture, Michaels stood tall, happy to gloat over the injustices over the ensuing weeks. If the WWF wasn't big enough for the two of them, well, one was gone, right? There would be no more Bret Hart for Shawn Michaels to stew over. Four months later, however, Michaels suddenly found himself at the possible end of his career. Back injuries had compounded to the point where he was staring legitimate retirement in the face. After dropping the title to Austin at WrestleMania 14, Michaels went away for a long time. Upon his return to the ring in 2002, he was far humbler than when he left, having finally cleaned up his bad habits and finding peace. Perhaps the greatest irony of it all is that at one time, Hart and Michaels were both seen as indispensable commodities by the WWF. Losing one or both seemed fatal. Then, they lost both, and the WWF went on to experience unseen heights through the Attitude Era, with Austin on top. Both indispensable stars had missed out on the WWF's last golden age. One excommunicated, the other injured. As for Vince, Montreal and the famous Brett Screwed Brett interview turned McMahon into a star heel. Months later, he began mining that legitimate heat by becoming Mr. McMahon, one of the greatest scripted villains in wrestling history. So much mileage was gained from Vince the heel that we forget that he wouldn't have existed without Montreal. Steve Austin's main event run and the WWF as a whole would have turned out much differently in the years to come. Eventually, fences were mended though. Hart re-entered the WWE fold in 2005 for a DVD project and went into their Hall of Fame the next year. A few years later, Hart and Michaels mended fences and even got on the same page for their own shared DVD release. And now, all seems to be well with the parties involved. Their legacies are cemented in a positive way and the incident is now simply pro wrestling law. And because it's law, we still talk about it. The conversation may never end. An angst-filled melodrama with elements of espionage film and political thriller is always going to captivate the mind, compelling us with its intricacies. We all watch wrestling for the stories, and it's fair to say that no scripted in-ring tale has ever, or perhaps could possibly ever, equal the maximum insanity of Montreal. It's a story that you just can't make up. <laughs>